Okay, we'll get going with the next talk here. Um, we've got uh, Michelle Tobias and Alex Mandel. Michelle's a geospatial data specialist at University of California, Davis, and uh, she's also a board member of OSGEO. Uh, Alex Mandel is a geospatial engineer at Development Seed, and Michelle and Alex have collaborated on a QGIS plugin to add a geospatial dimension to uh, research citations, and they're going to share some lessons from their experience to help break down the barriers to creating your own QGIS plugin. Uh, so the talk is pre-recorded, but uh, Michelle and Alex are here today. They're here right now. It's 4.30 in the morning in California, so show some mercy. Uh, but anyway, they're here to answer some questions after the talk. So yeah, please add your questions to the Venulus platform. So I'll fire up the video here. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for coming to our talk, uh, which is entitled QGIS Plugin Development is Not Scary, Lessons Learned from Literature Mapper. So who are we? <laughs> uh, my name is Michelle Tobias. I am the Geospatial Data Specialist at the University of California Davis's Data Lab, uh, and I'm the mastermind behind Literature Mapper, I guess you could say. Um, I most of my coding for this project has been in the realm of the text parsing that needs to go on in in making this plugin work. Um, and I just want to confess, I'm really bad at Python. Uh, I don't use it on a daily basis. So every time I come back to it, it's like starting over. So um, hopefully that's a little bit of an inspiration that you can do this too, even if you're not great at a particular language. Um, but I am a frequent user of QGIS, R, and SQL. So I do have a programming background, just Python isn't my daily jam. So um, also my co-presenter today is Alex Mandel. He is a geospatial engineer at Development Seed. Uh, for this project, he advises on things like feasibility. When I come up with grand ideas, he helps me figure out how this is going to work. Um, he did most of the coding for the interface functions and some of those kinds of things. Uh, and he is much better at Python than I am. So <laughs> that, that makes us a good team for this. And I just want to have a, a quick little disclaimer that Literature Mapper is not a product of UC Davis or Development Seed. This is something that we develop on our own time. Um, so it's not, it's not paid for by our respective companies. So what is Literature Mapper? Uh, it is an experimental plugin uh, for QGIS. Uh, it's, it's written in Python and it is currently available in the plugin repository. Uh, it is a tool that connects Zotero, which is an open source citation manager with QGIS, which you guys are all familiar with, I'm sure. Uh, and it allows users to georeference citations through QGIS. And it stores the location information alongside the Zotero database. So it puts it actually inside Zotero and stores it along with all of your citation information, like author and title of the of the text and uh, you know publisher and year and things like that. And it keeps all that spatial data together with the citation information so that everything stays in sync and you don't have to worry about having two files, um, you know, your spatial data separate from your uh, citation. So the idea is that it keeps everything together. And we've got a little screenshot of the tool itself in action. So you can see that, um, well, maybe you can because it's really small, but uh, there's columns in there for all the things that you might want to have in a citation, such as the, the title and um, things like that. And then there's also a geometry column. So this is sort of the workflow for Literature Mapper, how things work under the hood. Um, everything is stored in Zotero. We use the API uh, from Zotero to uh, generate a citation, and then we use Python to parse that into a table for, for QGIS. Um, and then continue using Python to generate the locations, which you, you digitize by hand, uh, but it's still better than, uh, it, you can't automate this process. It's something that needs to be done by hand. Um, so we use Python for that because that's what generates the interface. And then once you've generated your locations, we send it right back to Zotero with the API. So that's sort of the general workflow for this particular plugin. So a little bit of background on Literature Mapper is that um, 
academic journal articles are often about a specific location. So things like plants and animals, geology, social justice, history, all of these things happen in a location and that location actually matters. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a biogeographer by training. So things grow, plants grow in a certain place for a certain reason. And that location can be really important to understanding any information that I generate with research about that particular species, just for an example. Um, so we might actually care about the spatial distributions of the studies that people are publishing. All of this academic literature, um, maybe it matters where the, the studies are, are generated. Maybe it matters where, um, you know, certain aspects of history are taking place. And we actually want to see that on a map. Uh, but there's no way to do that. There's been no method to connect location data and your citation manager. Um, and that, that became a problem for me personally when I was working on my dissertation. Uh, so our, our team here identified a need that had no available solution. And that's really key to, to what we're going to be talking about today. So again, we identified a need that didn't have a solution. So we're not solving something that already has a solution. You've got to come up with something that um, is new. Um, so our building process in terms of creating this plugin is uh, we started with an idea. The idea actually was this piece of paper, which is a map, a really ugly map that I printed out on a printer um, many, many years ago and started marking locations of studies on it in pencil. Um, I have to confess that I have kept tabs on this piece of paper until last year. And now all I have is the scan. I don't know where the actual piece of paper is. It's probably in my physical office that I haven't been to in almost 10 years <laughs> or two years, sorry. Um, so, uh, Anyway, this started out as pencil annotations on a piece of paper, and we decided that we need to make this actually a, a tool, right? Um, so we started prototyping it. We made a proof of concept, uh, a plugin that kind of did what it needed to do, and we kept iterating on that until we had code that was ready for the QGIS plugin repository. Um, and then you know, we keep developing and we keep adding things to it. And now it's a tool that's actually gaining steady users, um, even though it's still obviously could, you can always make stuff better, but people are actually using it for its intended purpose. And that's kind of cool. So it's been through this whole stage from a piece of paper with pencil drawings on it into an actual valid research tool. Um, so next up, we're going to tell you about how to prepare for this, how to how to get going on making your own plugin. All right, so there are a few really important key things when you're thinking about making a new tool um, and a new plugin. And the first really big one is when you identify a need that you want to fill, you have to be very specific about what that need is and be very clear about what does not quite fit into that because you're going to come up with lots of ideas and they're, they might be related to your core need, but if they're not really critical, you want to put them aside and make a list for later so that you can actually get your tool working. All right, so then the first thing you want to do is now you've identified a need, you want to look at what already exists that's similar or related and how closely does it solve or not solve your problem. And then if you do find some things that are similar, you really need to try them out and see do they really not work for what you're trying to do? Um, is there really a reason why your particular way of doing or solving a problem is uniquely different that it requires a whole new tool or is there an option to maybe just add a feature to an existing tool or enhance an existing tool to make it also meet your need in addition to whatever else it was already doing okay and then once you've decided you're going to make your own tool or your own plugin think about the branding for it a little bit because 
you want a name that's unique and you want a name that clearly aligns with what your tool does. And you don't want that name to be similar to uh, anything else, whether it's a related tool or not. Um, you especially don't want it to, to be a name that's similar to an unrelated tool. So that when people are searching the internet, they find things that have nothing to do with what you're working on. But you also want to avoid, uh, as in one problem we discovered, which is there's a very similar tool out there called Journal Map, which we uh, came across a few years after we started, that does something similar, but not quite the same. Um, and the names are somewhat confusing and easy to, to mix up. And so, so now we have to work harder in order to differentiate our brand and our plugin to make it clear what our tool does versus what their tool does. And at least the good thing is now that we have communication with the other development team, um, we can jointly do some of that. All right, the next part of this is we're going to encourage you to make it happen. Uh, this is definitely something you can do. Um, so some of the tools in, in my arsenal for getting going and, and developing a product that actually functions and does what I want it to do is I often will just draw things out. Um, I actually I have a notebook. You can see <laughs> a screenshot or a, not a screenshot, but um, a, a scan of my notebook here in the corner. Um, draw out your workflow. What should it do? What pieces of information should move from one part of the code to the other? What should the interface look like? So in this picture, you can see I've actually drawn out what I want my interface to look like before I actually started putting it together. Um, and then you can see I've got some notes about like what each, um, what the button should do and what the code needs to look like under the hood. Uh, and then I've actually coded it and created that the actual interface. And this is um, a screenshot of the functioning interface that does something very similar to what the notes uh, in the notebook have. So I, I like to draw things out and it can be a really helpful way to see like, this, is this really what I want it to do? I don't want to spend time, you know, building it until I know that it's it's what I want and I'm on the right track. The other thing is, this might be the scariest part, you probably are going to have to level up your skills. So there are a lot of free resources uh, out there to help you learn what you need. Uh, for QGIS Python plugin development, you're going to need to know Python. Uh, you're going to also need to know PyQGIS. Um, that's the um, the Python tool that uh, works with QGIS. Um, there's also uh, information, a lot of good information uh, in the documentation about the QGIS plugin development workflow. So um, how you actually create a plugin and uh, what are all the bits and pieces that you actually need to make that go. Uh, and then also you'll need to learn how to use something like GitHub or some other version control system. And you really want that because that will help you. It's got great tools for um, not only versioning your code, but also tools for, um, in GitHub's case in particular, there's uh, things like the issues board where you can keep track of ideas and things that need fixing, or um, you can use branches and things like that for development. It's, it's just a really helpful tool to have, but use whatever version control system you like. I just highly encourage you to use one. Um, and then specifically for Literature Mapper, we actually had to learn how to use the Zotero API. So. Uh, they have an API that they use to um, to work with various tools um, that are associated with Zotero. So we could take advantage of that, um, and we had to learn that system. And it it's not super complicated, but it was something that you know it takes time to learn, and you have to be open to to learning these kinds of new skills in order to make your plugin work. And you know whatever plugin you have in mind, you'll probably have something similar. Um, some domain knowledge that you'll need in order to, to make your plugin work. And you can see my notes here. Again, <laughs> a clip from my notebook of trying to learn the Zotero API and making notes about what I needed to do. And I, I just find that helpful to have it on paper, but use your own system, whatever works. Uh, and then the next piece of advice, while you need to level up your skills in all likelihood, don't get stuck in the preparation phase. Um, learn the basics and move on because you could spend forever thinking, oh, I'm not that good at Python. I need to learn more. I need to learn more. But the truth of the matter is you're going to learn a lot as you develop your plugin. So learn the basics and get get moving on on making your plugin. You 
you definitely don't need to be good at Python to write useful code. It doesn't have to be pretty, it just has to work. So don't stress about that. There's always going to be someone that tells you your code doesn't look right or it's not structured right. Ignore them. Just write code that works and you'll be fine. Um, the other thing is to start small and add incrementally. So don't try to do everything at once. Don't try to make all the code at once. You're going to make yourself crazy hunting down bugs that way. Um, start with something like a blank uh, a blank plugin that doesn't do anything. It just adds it to the QGIS. Great, you've done something. Then maybe add a blank interface. And then once you get that working, add a button and then make the button do something and just keep adding piece by piece by piece until you get what you want. And then again, I've got a screenshot here of um, the plugin itself and a clip for my notebook of outlining what this interface should look like uh, just on paper and then making it happen. And then some notes about like, what are the, um, the variables that go into each of those boxes? Um, so you, you can see that this is, this is totally possible. It starts on a piece of paper and it eventually becomes code. Uh, so the next part of this is telling people. So when you're working on these plugins, it's all great and fine to do it for yourself, but the biggest benefit you can get is by sharing it with others. And this is just the underlying principle of open source community that if you share with others and they share with you collectively, we build all sorts of great things for each other all the time. And so, you know, one of those things is you have to let people into the process. You can't just hide your code and keep thinking, oh, I'll release it when it's ready. Um, because the when it's ready for you may never come. Uh, and so we encourage you to make an online repository. In this case, we used GitHub. And then we released the uh, alpha versions of the plugin to the QGIS plugin repository. We marked it experimental and just so people were aware that it wasn't a polished product. And we made a really straightforward one page documentation website and put that up and put it out there. And that was, you know, one of the biggest first steps in making this something useful is that now there's an opportunity to get feedback and for more people to test and the more people test, the more chance you'll find, you know, bugs that need fixing and hopefully bring in other people to help with uh, making it even better. So then there's some really good ways to make all of this uh, public communication better. And the first key one is write some documentation because people need to know how to use your tool. If they don't know how to use your tool, it's not going to gain any traction. Um, because nobody knows how to use it. And once you've got some documentation, and it doesn't have to be a lot, just the basics, tell people about it. Put it on social media, write a blog post or make a little web page about it. Go to a conference like Phosphor G and tell people about it. And uh, if you're an academic, write an article. So the last thing we want to leave you with is the encouragement that you can do this. This is something that um, I think most people could do with the right skills. So I just want to encourage you to give it a try, make your own plugin and, and see what you can do. Uh, and so with that, um, I guess we're ready for any questions and we're actually going to be live at Phosphor G to answer questions now. So thanks. And I hope, uh, I hope you do give this a try and, and let us know how it goes. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, thanks a lot. That was that was really cool. And you're both on mute. Oh, Alex, you're okay. There we thanks. go. That was that was cool. I love the collaboration. You both had some really uh, great advice there. Um, very encouraging too. So, thanks for that. Um, so yeah, let's let's jump into a few questions. Um, so the first question here is: uh, In your plugin, what does location mean? Is it author affiliation, study area, or editorial location? That's a really good question. Um, and the answer is you get to decide. 
I would encourage you to make sure that you make that decision up front and not mix your geometries so um, you know what they mean. You could probably even, um, in Zotero, you can group things into um, like folders or, or groups of citations. So you could you could decide for each one of those folders um, what what location you're marking. But yeah, you could you could make it anything you wanted actually. Okay. Um, we've got a couple of people asking about um, tutorials. So are, do you have any suggestions for good tutorials for studying the basics for developing QGIS plugins or any links? Yeah, so we mostly use the documentation that's in QGIS itself, as well as um, PyQT documentation. And then with all QGIS plugins, there's a great plugin out there actually called plugin builder that creates the basic plugin for you that you just have to add stuff to use it don't don't make all the files from scratch yourself have it build the the template out for you and then just start filling in things yeah i just dropped the link in the chat which is probably a little early not synced up with the feed but um there's the link there for the pi uh, qgs developer cookbook which we made a lot of use of it's got good explanations and um so yeah i, I would check that out i think that was useful okay. and i know somebody mentioned that a lot of tutorials aren't free but this one is right great yeah great resource okay cool um the, so this one's asking about uh, the built-in QGIS Python console editor feels extremely limiting compared to other IDEs such as VS Code. Uh, do you have any tips for effectively developing the plugin within QGIS? I don't think that even existed when we started writing the plugin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we use whatever code editor we want outside of QGIS and then uh, it, there's a way that you can actually, there's another plugin that automatically refreshes your code as you're working on it. So you can make edits to your code and then you can hit the refresh and use your plugin right away in, in QGIS. Um, and then there's also profiles in QGIS now, which lets you switch between, so you can have like the release version in one profile and the developer version in another profile and you can toggle between them to like see if you broke a feature or what the difference is and how they behave. Very cool. Um, here's one. Do you envision having a Mendeley or is that Mendeley plugin someday? What made you go with Zotero over Mendeley? So the honest answer is because I use Zotero. So that's what we started with. Um, also Zotero is really well documented and it's open source as well. Um, I'm not, is Mand Alex, do you know if Mendeley is open source? He's shaking his head no. So <laughs> that's what I thought. Um, so Zotero is, is another open source tool. So that's the main driver and the reason why I was using it in the first place. Um, also because there was problems. I used to use EndNote, but there was problems with a change in version that was going to cause problems. So that's why I originally switched to Zotero. So um, again, Zotero is open source. It, the API is really well documented. And the fact that you can add things to your account with the API was a big driving factor and what made this work. So that's why we chose that. However, um, if you go to our issue tracker, we do have an issue for developing um, this uh, literature mapper tool with Mendeley and other tools. So if anybody has experience and thinks they can contribute to that, we'd be happy to have help um, solving that particular issue. But right now, um, I, I don't have the time to do that, but we would We'd be happy to have help trying to figure out how to do that if anybody has the time and skills. Okay, um, here, here's uh, changing gears a little bit. How do you get over possible, this is not good enough, feelings and thoughts? <laughs> That's a really good question. I don't know that I've <laughs> overcome it. <laughs> um, I have complete <laughs> imposter syndrome this morning, standing, sitting here, um, possibly because it's it's just before 5 a.m. Pacific time, but also like <laughs> you just, you never feel like it is. You just put it out there and see, you know, how people react to it. And um, you just, you gotta be brave, <laughs> just do it. <laughs> You'll never feel like it's right. You'll never feel like it's good enough, but um, just, just try, see what happens. I think you'll you'll be surprised. Um, people, especially in the in the open source, you know, geo community, are way more supportive than than you might expect their general world, world to be. So, um, I just, yeah. it's okay. Do it. <laughs> super, super super supportive community. Yeah. Um, here's a probably this is a good one to finish up on. Uh, how did you end up working together on this plugin? 
<laughs> That's a really good question. Um, we actually um, have been, uh, how do you say this? Um, essentially, we're married, so that uh, works really well. We, you know, are in the same house. We are always <laughs> working on stuff together, like helping each other with things. So that that helps. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> okay well the, that is there anything else you want to share before we wrap up i guess just encouragement like if you're thinking about doing this just jump in try it you know give it a go yeah okay well cool thanks so much that wonderful talk i really appreciate it and um yeah thanks again thanks everyone okay